Abby Evans from the University of Washington, and I'm presenting Group Touch, Distinguishing Tabletop Users in Group Settings via Statistical Modeling of Touch Pairs. And this was work done in collaboration with Katie Davis, James Fogarty, and Jake Robrock. So tabletop computers, like the one pictured here, um, have a lot of potential for use in collaborative learning in classroom settings. Um, however, it's well documented within education research that students don't always know how to work together effectively. And collaborative learning on tabletop computers is just as susceptible to breakdowns as other forms of face-to-face -face learning. Tabletop computers could be a lot more useful in classroom settings if they were able to detect when groups were struggling and then adapt to help them collaborate more effectively. So one big problem with uh, commercially available tabletops that makes it difficult for them to really support collaborative learning is that they're not able to tell the difference between a single person and multiple people interacting with the screen. So for example, in this picture, we have three students all trying to pull um, the same object towards themselves. Um, but the computer has no way of knowing that they are three separate people. So it interprets, this, it interprets their touches as if they were carried out <coughs> excuse me, by a single user. And it scales the, uh, the object instead of translating it. And it may be tempting to think that this kind of thing isn't too big of a, too big of a deal. Um, they can just scale it back down, negotiate which student is going to take the object and get on with things. But while that may be a reasonable assumption in a workplace setting with adults who kind of have a shared goal and want to get on with the task, um, in classroom settings, um, incidents like this can actually derail the whole collaboration, simply because for a lot of students, messing about and seeing how giant you can make things is a lot more entertaining than the activity that was actually assigned by the teacher. So in order to be able to uh, detect and respond to situations like this, we need an approach to distinguishing among users so that we can prevent the tabletop from introducing new barriers to collaborative learning that weren't there before, and also so that we can enable software that can actually help um, to scaffold and shape the collaborative process. Sorry, I'm a little sick, so I keep running out of air. But <laughs> um, so any approach to distinguishing among simultaneous users needs to be appropriate for the context in which it's been used. So um, the other papers in this session, um, they've been kind of prototyping uh, new hardware, but we're actually working with something that's already out there, um, the Microsoft Pixel Sense, um, and try to make it a bit more useful for classroom settings. So there are a few challenges specific to classrooms that are important to understand as these really shaped our requirements. The first is that classrooms are full of children, and children don't always behave the way you expect uh, adults to behave. And so we're looking specifically at FTIR tabletops, um, which detect touches using infrared cameras embedded in the, the hardware itself. And what you're seeing here are the images recorded when I left a group of middle, middle school students alone with the computer for five minutes. So the implications of this are the approaches to distinguishing among users that rely on a degree of compliance from, from the users. Um, for example, with constraints and how they physically interact with, with the hardware. Um, these approaches are less likely to work well in classroom settings. Also, the physical spaces of the classrooms themselves have a lot of constraints. Classrooms are multi-use spaces um, used for a, vari a variety of activities by different groups um, throughout the course of a single day. And each group may come in and want to rearrange the furniture to support whatever they're, they're uh, doing for the day. Um, often these spaces weren't designed for collaborative learning in any form to begin with, um, let alone for the use of technology like this. Um, additionally, the changeover period between classes um, can be as short as five minutes. And in that time, the teacher has to set up everything that's needed for the, for the activities for the day. Um, and the technology is just one uh, part of that. So any technology that requires extra setup and calibration um, is not really practical in this setting and probably won't be very popular with teachers either. So we needed an approach to distinguishing uh, between users that was appropriate for these classroom settings given these challenges and constraints. There are a number of existing approaches to distinguishing among users at FTIR tabletops. Um, several of these approaches actually aim to track and identify individuals um, by matching touches to specific users. Um, and while that makes them really powerful, um, these approaches also either rely on external sensors, which require extra management, or they restrict how users can interact with the screen, um, requiring some compliance from them. So for these reasons, none of the existing approaches were really appropriate for um, the typical classrooms that we're working in. So with Group Touch, we've developed a method of distinguishing uh, users that would work well in the classroom um, because it uses only the built-in capabilities of the hardware and doesn't try to constrain the users in any way. 
So in order to achieve that goal, we forego actually tracking the users for the duration of the activity. So like the second paper in this session, if you were here for that, we're looking at a non-persistent user differentiation. Um, so group touch distinguishes among simultaneous users while they're active on the tabletop, but it doesn't track them uh, continuously. So the most generalizable use case for group touch outside of just education is improving gesture detection, so in situations like this. Um, we're also using it to model how groups are working together and then have the tabletop adapt to, to support collaborative learning. So there has been a lot of work in this area already, um, so I'm just gonna give an overview of, of the contributions that are most relevant um, and that focus on the same kind of hardware that we're working with. So prior work ranges from, on the left, approaches that uh, differentiate between fingers and hands, but don't actually uh, distinguish among users, to those at the far end that are actually able to track and identify the users. Um, group touch is somewhere in the middle. Um, we're aiming for uh, short-term user differentiation. And so remember, we're trying to do that kind of short-term user differentiation without uh, using extra sensors and without constraining the users. So starting with uh, prior work that's over on the left there, um, we have approaches to differentiating between fingers and hands. And they use information that can be extracted from the, the tabletop cameras, from the images, so things like finger orientation and hand contours. Um, and although these approaches don't actually distinguish among users, the, these contributions have directly influenced our, our work um, because they uh, use the built-in capabilities only and they don't constrain interaction. But over on the far right, we have approaches that use um, extra sensors. For example, uh, mounting a depth camera above the tabletop um, to track users' arms and hands, or actually augmenting the users themselves with, um, with sensors. Um, so things like an infrared wristband or glove. So these approaches can be extremely accurate um, and can even identify users, which obviously could be very useful, but because of that reliance on additional hardware, they don't meet our requirements for use in the classroom. Finally, um, we have see me, see you. Uh, this approach is able to match touches to users using only the built-in capabilities of the hardware. It's very accurate and would be promising in classrooms, except if you notice in the image, everybody has their hand in this position. Um, and it's actually a requirement of the approach that people touch with their index fingers. Um, so for that reason, um, because it's constraining users, we weren't able to, to use that. So group touch has a slightly different goal as well from those approaches on the far right, in that we're aiming to distinguish among users as they're active, but not uh, have that distinction persist for the whole activity. So group touch was developed and evaluated using touch data collected in the wild um, during a study of collaborative learning at tabletop computers and classroom settings. Our participants were high school students in two different educational programs, um, and they were using multi-touch applications that we built for Microsoft Pixel Sense. Um, the first setting was an after-school science program, um, and this had 11 students, and they used the computer in groups of five or six for about 30 minutes ago um, over four sessions. Um, and they were working on a custom-built mapping application that supported their particular curriculum. So the second setting was a summer user-centered design course. Um, we had 16 students in this setting, um, and they worked in groups of three, over three to four, um, and we recorded 13 group sessions here. And again, we built an uh, application specifically for the program. Um, in this case, we, they were using four distinct multi-touch applications. Um, all of the sessions were video recorded so that we could later label the touches with the, the author to, to check um, the accuracy of our approach. So group touch has two components. The first is a machine learning model that uh, looks at pairs of touches and um, predicts whether they were carried out by the same user or by two uh, different people. Uh, the second component is an algorithm that takes those predictions and uses it to group the touches into sequences of touches that were likely to have been carried out by the same person. So for each pair of touches, we look at three features. Uh, the first is the distance between the touch points. Uh, the second is the difference in the touch orientation. And third is the time that elapsed between the touches. Um, before we can train our model, uh, we had to do a bit of normalization to get all the features to fall between zero and one. Um, so for distance and orientation, this is straightforward as uh, they're naturally limited. Um, but for time, there's no obvious limit there. So we set it to 307 seconds, which was the 90th percentile of time between touches by the same person in our data set. 
So the next step of pre-processing is to put the touches into pairs. And so I'm going to use an example to explain how we do that. So we process the touches in the order that they, they were carried out. Um, in this example, we've got three students working together, A, B, and C. So if we have a touch come in by student A, um, we first create a pair with that new touch and the last touch by the same user. And then we give that uh, pair the label same. We then uh, create touch pairs with the new touch and the last touch by uh, each of the other users in the group. So they have, those touch pairs have the label different. Um, and for each touch, we end up with as many pairs as there are users in the group. So overall, we recorded 17 sessions of touch data. So to train the model, um, we would take 16 of those sessions um, and then test it using the unseen data from the 17th session. Um, and then we repeat that process 17 times withholding a different session of uh, test data each time. After the model categorizes a touch pair um, with the same or different label, the next step is to establish those groups of touches likely to have been carried out with the same person. Key to our approach is that a group is not the same thing as a user. Um, a group of touches is uh, just a group of touches that belong to a single user, and it represents a period of sustained interaction. So each user will likely have um, several touch groups over the course of their time at the tabletop. So the first touch creates the first group. Then for every subsequent touch, a touch pair is created with the last touch in each group already established so far. When the MLP model is queried, it returns the probability that the last touch was by the same person. Um, and if that probability is less than a specified threshold, a new group will be started. So in this case, the threshold is set to 0.8. Um, you can see there that the model gives a probability of 0.61, which is below our threshold, so we start a new group. In the case where the model returns um, probability above the threshold for multiple groups, um, we simply put the touch in the group that had the highest probability. So to evaluate group touch, we take one of those models trained on data from 16 of the study sessions, and then we process each touch in the test session in the order that it occurred. So for each consecutive touch, we pair it with the most recent touch um, in each touch group. We then query the model um, and send the prediction back through the grouping algorithm to assign the touch to a group. We repeat that process uh, for different uh, values of that probability threshold ranging from 0.5 to 0.9, um, and for each study session as the test data. So to settle on an ideal val uh, value of that probability threshold, we looked at three metrics. The first was uh, the within group accuracy, so the percentage of touches that were assigned to a group where the last touch was by the same person. And you can see that um, as the probability increases, the accuracy also increases, as you might expect, because the model is more confident that they are the same person. But um, what you also find is that as that probability threshold increases and accuracy increases, you also see fewer touches get added to existing groups. So we also looked at how long the touch groups persisted. Um, at each value, and uh, yeah, you can see the, the, the touches last uh, for shorter and shorter periods of time as the value goes up. Um, finally, um, we also look at when a new touch group was started, how long had it been since the last time that person had actually touched the screen? Um, and this is important because when the time between groups of touching, touches belonging to the same person is brief, it becomes more likely that sustained input by a single person is going to be attributed to multiple people. So based on these metrics, we selected 0.8 as our probability threshold because for us it was the best balance between decent accuracy and touch groups that persist for long enough to actually be able to do useful things with it. Um, so this table shows the overall accuracy for group touch um, with a threshold set to that value of 0.8. Um, the focus here is the third column, um, which shows the accuracy after the touches have been grouped um, by, by each uh, session. So the average accuracy was just under 93%. So the reason group touch only distinguishes among users for uh, short periods of time and doesn't track them for the whole uh, session is because the grouping algorithm also produces a lot of false negatives. And that occurs when a touch is, uh, is used to start a new group when there was a, a group already available with touches by the same person. So this graph shows the average characteristics of touch pairs carried out by the same person plotted against the, the MLP model's uh, probability that they were in fact the same person. So everything below that threshold of 0.8 um, is a false negative. And what was interesting was that 62% of the false negatives actually occurred when the probability was below 0.1. So the model was really convinced they were different people. You can also see that that's when the, the touches were most different from each other. <coughs> uh, 
Um, the big takeaway here as well is the impact of time um, between touches on the prediction. Um, and you can see way over on the left there, the blue value, that's time. Um, and what you're seeing is that um, for those values below 0.1, um, it had been on average more than two and a half minutes since that person had, had actually last touched the screen. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm just quickly going to go over some use cases, um, the first of which is improving gesture recognition. I think a lot of our use cases are quite similar to what you had in Ghost ID as well. But um, so we have, uh, by default, the computer recognizes these three people as, as one. Um, with group touch, we're now able to uh, detect that it's three separate people, and we can uh, have the computer respond accordingly. We're also using, um, using uh, group touch to detect when there's conflict between users or when they're interfering with each other. So um, if you watch the student on the right, you can see he keeps reaching into other people's cards to change them because they weren't doing things the way he wanted them to do. So um, he was annoying them quite a bit with that. Um, and with group touch, we'd be able to detect when this is happening and, and decide how, how best to respond. Um, finally, uh, we're, this is what we're actually working on right now, um, using group touch to model collaboration as it's happening um, and to detect interaction patterns at the group level that are associated with uh, positive or negative behaviors in collaborative learning so that we can actually build software that will adapt. So future work includes what we're already, what I just described, we're already working on that. Um, also, now that we can detect these conflicting gestures, um, it's, we need to explore how best we can resolve them um, and under what conditions. And this could build off of work already done by Mary Morris and her colleagues. Um, another uh, area for future work would be to integrate group touch with existing methods that uh, use hand geometry to um, detect between fingers and hands, um, as that may help to improve the accuracy. So to wrap up, group touch is an approach to distinguishing among users at a tabletop computer without constraining the users and using only the built-in capabilities of the hardware. Um, the overall accuracy shows that it was, it was successful at grouping touches that belonged to the same user. Um, and we saw little variation um, in the accuracy across 17 sessions of touch data um, collected in five different applications. So that suggests that group touch is user independent and can perform consistently well across a range of applications. Um, so thank you. Um, I'm happy to answer questions at best time. Hi, I'm Wellin from Tsinghua University, and I have a, a question to ask. Is that uh, you mean that the a model and the patterns is based on the data, but you know the data, the user's data we can use is limited. So uh, what do you think about the overfit of the data and how do you solve this problem? Thank you. Sorry, what, can, can you repeat it's, that? Uh, the problem of the overfitting, overfitting. overfit of oh, the data. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you think when the process that we used to kind of train and test it um, uh, was, which should hopefully avoid that overfitting. We did a fair amount of balancing of the data as well, and the scaling of the features should help with that too. Um, and also because, because we, um, in each case, with each session, that had always been completely unseen to the process of the training the model and the, the algorithm beforehand. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Hi there, my name is Matt uh, from the University of Colorado. I uh, really appreciated the talk. I'll be really interested to see when you get hand geometry working. Um, but I'm just wondering for now, why did you choose the particular factors that you did? Um, so we looked at a bunch of different factors, inclu including some other uh, features that had been used in, particularly CME, CU. They had a few more features being included. Mm -hmm. um, and I did uh, look at including the bit, uh, in going through the process of feature selection, those uh, features had very negligible effect. Those three, and it was, I was quite surprised that it was only three, but those three were really, really powerful, particularly time. Um, yeah. Thank you. 